Well, the talks have been very good so far, and I am honoured to be included in the list of speakers. Um, it, it's very funny. People sometimes ask, I've already been asked today, about DASO, and they know of the aviation side of the uh, corporation. Systems was founded about 20 years ago, um, around CAD and design has grown through that into product life cycle and then integrated information management systems. So we're, we're a reasonably uh, significant player in this area. And I come from a chemistry background, right? I did my chemistry in the UK. And so what has that got to do with a corporation that manages information? Well, when you start to think about design, when you think about supply chain and sustainability and all of these messages we've heard, especially about the idea of varietal development and agrochemicals, you start to realize that innovation and innovation at the materials end because labor arbitrage, managing uh, distribution, all of those have finite gains. It is the materials and the science and the understanding of that that gives you what is a sustainable competitive advantage. But that is, as John said at the beginning, not an island of itself. It is an integrated process with all the other elements that go and constitute a business. So there's the financial understanding, there's the design thinking, as we just heard from Maria, there's all of the elements that fit into that. So when you think about innovation, when corporations face this, you face it in light of things like the United Nations Global Goals, where there are questions about health and wellness, changing the profile of what people eat. There are questions about energy usage and trying to understand how we manage recycling, how we manage consumption, how we manage the distribution how we get away from having data centers that consume energy profiles the size of large cities. So there are many different drivers that set the tone behind that innovation profile. What do companies do? What do organizations do? Well, they try and focus on the things that are important to their customers because that's one element. They're trying to make a, a, a profit. An organization is always trying to do that to some way. They go through, as we heard, collaboration, internal, external, networked consortia. They go through an area which I spend a lot of my time in, which is predictive science and data-driven insights. First question, what's been done in this field? What could be done? Now, yes, correctly, there is the moth around the flame. There is the idea of inhibiting sometimes creativity. But if you can filter out at least some of those things that don't work, you have more time for the higher value activity of designing and discovering, developing. Obviously, there's regulatory and risk mitigation. Anyone who works in the chemical industry fully understands that it's all about time and money, right, and risk. Those are the big three things. How long will someone pay for this? And what's the risk and issue relative to my portfolio? What's the risk relative to a regulatory lock-in or lock-out? What are all of those elements? And then the simplification. Many, many organizations we deal with have really complex processes. They have lots of people. They have lots of layers. All of these layers need to communicate and collaborate and track information. And frankly, most of them there's about 8% of the information they produce is dark. It's used once and then thrown away. Or another way of looking at it is the li average lifespan of information in those corporations is about six months. So how do they prioritize innovation and try to do that in a way that is more benign, more friendly? Well, they tend to focus on four areas. They focus on unifying their processes through a digital experience, a digital connected methodology. That is around the idea of virtual design. We've seen the change in the consumer products area from conventional shops to online shopping. We're seeing it across every other area. You bought your ticket probably online at a website to fly here, right? And that involved checking your credit card, checking the booking availability, checking the fleet availability, the maintenance, the, all the design and configuration of that routing and those systems. People talk about a digitally connected supply chain, so no one wants to hold inventory. They want to minimize that. They want to have just-in-time supply of parts. If you go back 
to what Toyota and Honda founded about 18 to 20 years ago, the idea of one production line, multiple products flowing down it, a little bit unlike we do at the moment in other industries where we have multiple production lines for separate products. It's delivering at speed and at scale. Um, on the innovation area, it's very funny. I once had a, a conversation with a good friend of mine in Proctor's. And, and my wife had said, there's this very interesting little additive. It's about hair color. She, she's big on hair, as, as, my, as ladies tend to be. And, and she said, what do they think about this? So I asked them. They said, we're not interested. You can't produce it in 10,000 ton plus scale. So it's just not something we would go to. So it's a little bit about not just the invention, and maybe the invention in a couple of cycles gets to be something you produce. It's about volume, scale, and global reach for some of the large players. And then it's about the digital innovation element, right? Creating, designing, discovering, using virtual models to, as I said, eliminate wasted or bad experiments, but more importantly, about using those to estimate what might happen, the whole idea of environmental toxicology, being able to track what potential breakdown products are of a material, having a risk profile for that material before you go to market, where you look at each of the stages of your development process, and at each of them you impose more and more stringent filters on what people use and what people have and how they can move those forward from early onset in invention, through technology development, into product development, claim support, and then out to final market release. Let's see if this video plays. It might not. OK. So when we talk about sorry, video sec, in success in the areas that are obvious that everyone knows, the ideas of you know, water maintenance, products, consumable cities, the environment, paper. We talk about the idea of social ideation, streamlining communication, structuring continuity, improving the agility, and speeding execution. Right? And that whole process, when you start to condense it, really focuses on a social element. How do people communicate? How do they interact? So many things now, if you talk to the under 30s, will go on Twitter, will go on social media. How does that affect the innovation process? And that is a purely digital approach, by the way, right? There are more emails, more Snapchats sent now than all of the postal services in the world. It's all about speed. It's all about a single source of information. One of the problems that bedevils medium and large scales organizations are they have multiple systems. They have their manufacturing execution system, their enterprise resource planning, they have the discovery and innovation system, they have their safety system, they have their human capital management system. There is no connection between them. And then those systems overlap, they overlap between production and development and innovation, so there's no information flow bi-directionally and they end up with confused problems and products, and we can go back over the history of various chemical products that have gone through that. There is sustainability. Right? How do I design materials that use less water? Because it's a question of what happens to water consumption as we go forward. Will it become a taxed commodity? Right? We run majority as the chemical industry of our reactions, our products, our processes in the most common available solvent. Well, what happens if population growth gets to a point where that becomes a competition for that material? And then obviously, the speed and execution and doing that in a smart way. And one of the things that we try to do, that we see many other organizations trying to do, is to bring this all together in a simplified manner. So they want to structure that social collaboration between someone who makes a product and someone who contributes, someone who has an idea, someone who is a salesperson, who's heard it from a customer, someone who's gone to the website and posted a piece of information. They want to collaboratively understand what that need is in the consumer goods, in the food area. It's what do they want? What's the first moment of truth when someone takes a product and tries it goes, I want that one, and then the second moment of truth when they actually use it and it works. And of course, that's all around social. You get that. The other side is the engineering. The guy that makes the production line, that makes the plant, that puts the product together, that engineers the supply chain. And then there's all of the formal requirements. And historically, these have been two different areas, social and structured. And one of the things we're seeing is the development now 
of an integrated communication approach where people use technologies to connect people and resources, because at the end of the day, it is all about mapping resources and technology together. All right, moving on. So this happens, you'd be surprised in many different companies. That's just a quote from Tesla. It's about getting the systems, getting technology, getting the processes which have been embedded in the organizational structure out of the way and allowing people to communicate and design. So let me focus on a different area for a second. This is London. This is London in the 1800s. And water, as I mentioned, was an important resource even then. People used to get water delivered from standpipes. They used to get it delivered from water carts, right? Water was important. This guy on the left, John Snow, you've probably heard of him. He was the anesthesiologist to Queen Victoria, so he gave her anesthetic when she had her two children delivered. He also was a part-time cartographer. He was interested in maps. Now, why does this matter? Well, in 1854, someone put up a new set of houses, right? Property development went on even then. Very nice houses. They were near a brewery, so people could go and get food and drinks and beverage, and they were near a water standpipe. And as that went on, suddenly bad things happened. So the space of, space of a weekend in 1854, 600 people died. Right? And there was lots of hypothesis in the, uh, the popular press at the time that it was ghosts, it was things coming off the river. Right? When they looked at it, Jon Snow took his map out and started drawing pictures, and those are coffins, of uh, where people died. And what he realized was it was right by a pump, right? a water pump that people used to fill the water. It wasn't at the brewery. It wasn't at the boarding house where there's a high concentration of people, so it wasn't a transmission issue. It was right at that pump in the middle of Broad Street. That picture I showed you earlier was Broad Street. And so what he figured out was that the water was the source of the infection. In fact, he was the father of epidemiology. He was the first person to realize that the supply chain could actually cause a problem, that that system of having water brought from aquifers was no good if they dug the aquifer through what was the cesspit from a previous development. And the idea of mapping that information in a spatial context is something we see parallels of today. So in the bottom right here, you see some work that we've been privileged to do with the city of Singapore, where we built a virtual model of the whole of operating Singapore so that they can make design decisions and planning decisions. And again, that matters simply because it kills a lot of people. And this has been the basis, if you look back at some of the other corporations, I'll call out one, Unilever, who originally made Lifebuoy soap to help with washing and simple elements of cleaning. So disease is an issue. And when we look at the pharmaceutical side of chemistry and chemical materials, we see that disease to treatment, there are multiple steps and multiple stages, and all of these require coordination, collaboration, multiple iterations of design, and information flow. So to go from the disease, which might be a biological material, to the treatment in the top right, which might be a log biological material, there are many different elements. We've heard about next-gen sequencing and analytics relative to, uh, to building new phenotypes and agri agricultural products. It also clearly applies to understanding the response and companion diagnostics, where we're actually looking at how a specific subset of the population responds to a material versus other parts of the population. Now, where does that go? Well, 2017, about halfway through the year, the FDA announced a plan to do more simulation, more virtual models, because remember, I said at the beginning, I live quite a lot of time in the virtual world. And these include the idea of virtual tests, right? So being able to understand how those relate to the chemistry and the materials, whether it's the drug eluting stent or reducing the skin tear factor of a needle syringe so that you can actually use them on children without them getting very upset, or of course the prostheses. 
But it goes beyond that because one of the areas that people are now working on is things like this, where I have a model of the human heart. In fact, that is the FDA approved global model. Right? We developed it over five years. It allows us to look at the electrical flow. It allows us to look at the mechanical flow. So it just takes a second to bring it up. It allows us to model what happens with arrhythmia. So now that you can look at your heart beating and then suddenly it starts to stop beating. and What is happening and why is that? And then it also allows doctors to go in and look and plan surgeries. So here you now see a pacemaker wires. And where do I place those? Because they're not sort of regular, as you can see those blue and red lines in there. And how are those positioned within the system? So that's pharmaceuticals. Let me talk about materials. You tend to sort of get people who will talk about these two as separate. I like to put them together and talk about disruption and design and manufacturing. So materials matter. Right? All of the digital equipment we have here, all of our cell phones, most of our cosmetics, right? Most of our clothing have some sort of performance coating. The OLEDs, which we're all wanting to get in our next watch or our phone or our system like that, right? Organic light emitting diode display systems and polymer systems. Through to more interesting things like carbon composites, which is where you start to look at things like the Dreamliner and the A350 and understand how those are built and what the trade-offs are. Interesting point as we talk about that and we talk about the idea that this is a global issue. If you look at constructing the Dreamliner, you'll find that Boeing also has a side business. They make short chop fiber fills for car manufacturers. So they have a high failure rate in casting those parts and very, very high quality requirements. What do they do? They recycle the about two-thirds of those that aren't made and aren't manufactured correctly, and then they chop them up. And they built a whole supply chain process to commercially take care of their waste. What's really interesting is that is one of the biggest economic benefits and the tipping points relative to that whole program is that you can actually recycle the carbon fiber and then sell it on into the car manufacturing domains and other areas as well. So it's a worldwide effect. Everyone looks at this. It's a time of rapid evolution and expansion and uh, innovation. And those innovations come in different areas. So here you see a couple of little parts. One in the top right is the idea of understanding innovation in power generation. Polymer fuel cell systems, that's a Nafian polymer simulation. Or in photovoltaics, those are the, the well-known Tesla roof tile approach, but there are many other corporations producing those, or in thermal barrier materials. And just for the sake, that is a, an arc jet test of a, of a re-entry tile originally done for the, the, the space shuttle program, but it talks about that. So all of those, there are design requirements. So when I start to build my energy storage material, there is a shape. There is whether I'm using it in an automotive and I have certain crash requirements or whether I'm using it like the, the Mercedes supply unit, which is made by SK Innovation and SK in Korea, who are using it for a domestic supply. Therefore, there are other requirements from fire. There are requirements over testing and strength. There are multi-scale requirements that go all the way from the vehicle service life. One of the biggest problems in California right now is understanding how you discharge a Tesla car if there's been a major crash. They know how to empty the fuel tank. They didn't have protocols in place up to three months ago how to discharge a battery car if there'd been a major accident. Because it's sometimes not all nice and regular and structured. It's been bent around, as they say, the axle. All the way back through layout, thermal management, Right, if you are going to use the ultra fast mode in your battery car, what happens to the heat dissipation? How long can you do that? All the way back to the fundamentals. And on the fundamentals, what we're talking about is integrating the information all the way from the chemistry, the anode, the cathode, all the way through additives, all the way through 
the electrolytic performance, because this governs the thermal output, and the thermal output govern the performance of the system, which then allow you to make design choices. So those tens of thousands of potential combinations need to be managed in an innovation approach, and they need to be managed in the different way that allows people to make their choices. Other parts in the automotive field, Right? Everyone is aware that there is a strong alliance between Dow and Ford on the plastics and plastic composite areas. And it's all around light weighting. It's all around the idea of higher performance, durability, also designing for reuse. Um, just in preparation for this, I went and checked. Mercedes averages over 80% recycling across their main fleet now. They design that into the products. They break down the rubber, the plastics, the electrical components, the subsystems, the metals, the flash surface plastic metallized systems as well. And they have recycling structures in place and recycling supplies or process chains that cover that. So again, lighter, stronger, faster in light of design and evolution. And why does that matter? Well, it matters because you've got to be able to do an understanding of how a crash impact occurs and whether when you change your next plastic it improves it or it reduces it, right? Let me just get through that. The other aspect is sustainability. How well can I recycle it? And the funny thing about that that, that, that amuses me is this, this car in the bottom left was the one of the original four Dearborn cars, right? And it's actually made out of a cellulosic polymer system. Not very sustainable, not very good. I still wonder where the door handle is in that car, actually. Um, but it was made all the way back in the 1940s. So people are still trying to fix this. They're trying to understand how all of the various elements and how they define what elements they use that go in that allow them to manage that recycling as they come out. Light-emitting diodes. Everyone likes very nice, bright lights. I occasionally get on my mountain bike when I have time and love cycling in the evenings when it's quiet and you can watch the wildlife. And you have nice, bright lights. They have low power consumption. They're wonderful little things. But the problem is, how do we recycle those? This has been mentioned before. Building up a huge number of iPhone waste products every year or every two years leads to issues, right? and complexity. Protection, filtering, top right, again, understanding the ideas behind desalination. What happens at a chemical level, at a materials level, with flow, with different polymers and different polymer design configurations? Do I layer them? Do I stack them? Do I arrange them in a specific pore structure? How does that work? Functional densification, yes, everyone likes drones or talks about drones, especially in where I am. Um, they're getting smaller, and those size requirements drive certain specific needs on materials and material parameters. Consumer goods. We talked about shoes earlier, and it's very interesting that now we're getting to a point that you can actually do additive design of shoes. So you go into the shoe store, you select the shoe type, they weigh you, size you, look at how you walk on a pressure pad, and then design the infill pattern for you. If you talk to companies like Adidas, you talk to companies like New Balance, they will say they're not going to be mass manufacturing anymore. They're going to contract that out on a point basis on their high-end shoes, right? They are going to make that a consumer just-in-time production process. They don't make thousands of these things, they make them as you want them, as you order them from the combination of those. Of course, reuse matters, even for those shoes, plastic bottles, we can make houses out of them, but they tend to not be very good on the property market. One other point in materials, and why innovation matters. Additive manufacturing, the ability to take a metal powder and an energy source or a polymer system and extrude it or a ceramic system and melt it to make a part, 
to make a shape of a part, to make it directly from a design, or to take it as an MRO operation, where I take a, an existing part, I scan it, I look at the delta, and then I build it on. Each of those processes, you can see it as I start to scan and build up. I have a thermal cycle. That thermal cycle affects the materials. The intellectual property around how I make my scan to build up the part, left, right, up, down, diagonal, hash, whatever I do, the hash map structure, all of those are materials dependent and have a direct consequence on the lifetime performance of the system. How it works, how it functions, what it does, what is duration? Now, sometimes in an additive approach, you want to. You want to build something with an inbuilt obsolescence, right? So people keep rebuying it. Sometimes you want to have it and say it's a specified part, especially if I'm in a transportation area or a transportation domain. And so all of that really comes back to a materials modeling and engineering process. If I understand this, if I document this and manage it, I can understand and predict the lifespan. And how I understand it is through my testing. I do testing and management so I know what I'm making, what my more raw materials are, how I qualify them, what the duration performance of my system is, all the way through. So one of the areas I talked right at the beginning was social collaboration and how you bring design and requirements into a product lifecycle approach. Now I can start to think about the laboratory, not just the virtual design in the inception, but the laboratory man management and how all that information flows up and becomes available within an integrated approach. And why does that matter? Well, it matters because at the end of the day, everyone wants to take data and information and behaviors and learnings, as John pointed out with, with the principles. And they want to put that through a complex series of filters and pipes because really they want what's on the right-hand side. They want quality. They want compliance of their product. They want to democratize or empower decision makers. They want to do scientific innovation. They want to take all of those models and chain them together to make a simple decision-making system. And they want to do product and process development because they want to know what are the choices. If I switch to one chemistry, can I produce it with my current plant? Right? I remember the funniest thing when I was really starting my career. And we spent lots of time developing a catalyst system. Right? It was at BP. And we were really proud of this thing. And we trucked into the whole of the refinery operations team, laid it all out. And they all went, yeah, but what's it going to do to my plant? You show me somewhere it's been used before, otherwise I'm not risking something because I'm paid to operate 24-7, three, you know, 300 days a year plus, right, full system. So it's all about being able to link the product and the material to the process and the decision. And that's why when we talk about chemicals and innovation, we don't just talk around here in the box of material design although I do spend a lot of time there, we also talk about the engineering the plant and how you engineer it, the optimization of construction, right? What happens in a turnaround process? How long does that take? What's my maintenance? What's my maintenance operation? Through operations and then very interestingly decommissioning, right? How do I dispose of an asset? How do I replan an asset? How do I go through the life cycle? All of this is really around how innovation is managed, all the way from the right, all the way around that circle. And it comes down to four big trends. Right? It comes down to the digital use of technology to provide information to people using design-based thinking, as was said earlier. It comes down to the science and connecting the scientific validity into those systems so it's not just a SKU number, it's a SKU number which has properties and we understand those properties and we understand what the predictability and the error bar around those properties is. And most importantly, it comes down to collaboration. If we do collaboration, we can move from siloed individual thinking to connecting and managing information together. 
So that's why we have a, a simple mission statement at DASA. That's the mission statement. It's about sustainable innovations that link products and nature and human life. And I'll thank you very much for your time.